uh, the work that we are all involved in and where we are today as, as human beings is that we've never had to face the complexity of the issues that we, have, that we face right now. Nowhere in no time in human history have we had to face the multiplicity of different issues that are impacting us from, uh, from uh, extinctions of species, loss of biodiversity, uh, desertification, desalinization, all of those issues impacting our food, global contaminants and toxins, global sickness and diseases, and if you're in environmental studies or if you watch the news at all, you know the rest. My point of it is, is that the complexity that we're facing right now is under an umbrella of global climate change. We've never had to engage with this type of complexity before. Complex issues demand complex thinking, and complex thinking then engages and uh, creates an opportunity to bring knowledge systems from all around the world together to be able to share ideas, concepts, practices and processes to be able to help resolve some of the, uh, the issues that we're facing. So real true innovation is going to come from knowledge systems coming together. And again, let me be very clear on this. It's not about an add and stir. It's about recognizing the integrity and the authenticity of each knowledge systems, creating real opportunities for facilitation and, and true collaboration based on uh, mutual benefit and respect for knowledge. And at the same time, creating the opportunity for real practice to develop, real innovation to come forward in that. And it's our responsibility then to work on behalf of the future generations to ensure that for all of us that they have clean air, clean water, uh, abundant food, that they have good clean lands and uh, lots of biological, great rich biological life around them so that they can enjoy the same privilege that we've been given. We oftentimes talk about our creation teachings and be clear on this is that creation is not something that happened two billion years ago. Creation is continuing to unfold as we are here right now. And we have a distinct role in ensuring that creation will continue to unfold the way our creator intended it. And we have that as human beings right now have the opportunity to, uh, to influence how creation unfolds. We can either work for the continuation of life or we can work to destroy, to deter, and to degrade life. That's our choice. And each one of those choices has consequences. We can work uh, in the destruction of the natural world, but then get ready for more of the things that we're seeing here in terms of human suffering, uh, ecological collapse that's all around us, global weather events that are impacting all of us in one way or another. Or uh, we can work in the other way and work for the continuation of life and enjoy those things that we've been promised of peace, love, happiness, joy, and that's our choice is what we want to do. I come from a strong background in the sciences trained in earth system science and physics, and I'm very interested in how the world works from that point of view. I think there are very powerful things that come from that point of view, and also many problems and many blind spots. I've also come to learn that there are many ways to learn and know the world, and one of the most powerful ways of guiding my ethical decisions in life has come from inspiration from the wisdom traditions of indigenous peoples around the world. And so I felt it'd be really nice for the two of us to have a conversation about this relationship, which historically has ranged from tenuous and destructive and violent and horrible to occasionally beautiful and wonderful. And so <laughs> we're trying to find our way toward the beautiful. <laughs> I almost see say what Dr. Reed did, and I say what's a new need on a Guego Scano. So uh, my name is Roroya Gawin. It means he clears the sky, and I'm a Turtle Clan Mohawk from uh, Six Nations territory. So happy to be here today, and I bring you greetings uh, of happiness, health, and peace. One of our conversations that we had talked about was this idea that uh, you know how knowledge systems interact, and how people interact, and we go way back. You know uh, our People are, well, I, mean, I don't know if we're fortunate or not, but we were one of the first ones uh, to meet the early Europeans way back in the 1613. 
Uh, when the Europeans came into our territory, uh, we were the first ones to greet them. And we established a relationship with them, the early Dutch. And uh, they, we uh, developed a, a belt out of that. We oftentimes refer to that as the Gaswenta, or they sometimes call that the Turo Wampum Belt. And if you can imagine uh, tubular beads that are all strung together in a belt, in a white belt, signifying the river of life. And on the river of life, there are two purple lines uh, that signify two vessels sailing down the river of life together. One is a European sailboat, the other one is a canoe. And inside of that is all of our customs, our laws, our ways of life, our spirituality, our language, our peoples, our territory and respective in, in each one of those canoes. Our responsibility is to sail down the river of life together. Those principles and the, the space in between it are separated by three columns of beads that oftentimes represent peace, friendship, and respect. So the principles are there for how the nations interact with one another. So where we are today is that the river of life is in trouble and it, this, it, and it necessitates us bringing those principles back to life again and being able to revitalize that ancient relationship to share knowledge, to share our assistance and our love for the earth and for all of creation, to work for the continuation of all life. That's our, our responsibility. So to start our conversation, you know, it's important that we have that process and understand that this is nothing new. This is not N-E-W new, this is K-N-E-W new. Because one of the things that has been very powerful for me with my interest in the history of the earth is how there is a continuous flow of life on this planet that goes back at least 3.8 billion years. And one of the astonishing things to me was the observation that as soon as there was life on earth, there's never not been life on earth. Like the earth is like Goldilocks. It's not too hot, it's not too cold, it manages to keep the conditions just right. And there's a, a theory that was uh, formulated starting in the 1970s called the Gaia Hypothesis by a scientist named James Lovelock who recently passed away. And he articulated the idea that the Earth herself, through the living systems of the Earth, maintained the conditions conducive to life. And so this idea that we're held in this holy covenant between nations, for me feels like something that humans are learning to express in the kinds of treaties that you described and the relationships, and that this is actually a sacred bond for all of life that goes back 3.8 billion years. And I feel now that we're in a moment where life on the planet is not so much threatened that the Earth is likely to die, the Earth is so much more powerful than we are, but that we have, as humanity globally, not as all cultures of humanity, but sort of the, on balance, the largest majority of humanity, has forgotten this covenant and is acting as though the rest of that friendship and trust with the rest of life doesn't matter. And it seems to be to our peril. And so I wonder what, what advice you might give, especially to the young people here, about how we might restore that, that covenant, that relationship with the river of life. I guess, um, you know, for us and in, uh, in our program, so I'm a professor at Trent University and I'm the director, co-director for the Indigenous Environmental Studies and Sciences program. And, uh, you know, one of the things that we uh, provide is uh, the opportunity for students to be, to have a, a greater cultural understanding and to pull our original teachings forward. Part of that, uh, those original teachings talks about the stories of origin or our creation or our Genesis teaching. And they talk to us about this idea that as human beings, when we were created, and they talk about the creation of four sacred colors of human beings, black, red, yellow, and white. Lots of different shades in there today, but the original thinking behind that was four sacred colors of human beings that were given original instructions about how to live in the world. We weren't told about how to you know, do different things and how to be, but uh, the premise behind it was that those original instructions provide for us that, uh, and again, to share you know, just a, a three simple ones that we like to talk about is the idea of uh, individuals, or pardon me, of human beings always helping and being uh, care, careful with one another, to love each other, to, uh, to always help and to assist one another, to share with each other, to be generous. The second one they talk about is uh, to learn how to live within the cycles and balances of the natural world and that nature would be our teacher. And for us then to begin this process of learning from nature. 
so that whenever our great ancestors needed anything, they went to the spiritual world, they went to nature, and they asked for help. And it was those things that manifested themselves according to our, our oral tradition that manifested ourselves uh, to be able to come, or themselves to be able to come to us and provide for us uh, um, the teachings or the, the way of life that we needed to understand and use. So they not only gave themselves up, but they also gave us our protocols, our ceremonies, our words, our speeches, our dances, our ceremonies to acknowledge them. And they said, as long as we continue to have this relationship with them, they'll continue to be there and continue to help us. So our responsibility is to learn from the cycles and balances of the natural world. And that's the last one that's probably the most important is to always be thankful, to be thankful for all of those things that work to sustain and to perpetuate life. And if we can understand that and we can go back to those original teachings, it talks to us then that while we may think that knowledge is new and emerging or we may think that we've lost knowledge, those things that have provided those original knowledge, those plants, those animals, those birds, all of those spiritual beings, our ancestors, all the things that exist in the world are still there. And they're asking us now when we need help that, to go to them and that they're there to help us, just like they helped our great ancestors so long time ago. And our great ancestors, while they were great, were just human beings, just like us. And when we went to them and asked, uh, we went to creation and asked them for help, they emerged and they came to us with uh, all the things necessary to help support us. So many of the things that we are you know, um, experiencing today, all of the elements of the human condition, all of the elements of the human experience, our ancestors have provided for us and indigenous cultures all over the world that have maintained their ancient relationship, that have maintained their territory, that have maintained their ceremonies and their spirituality still have many of the answers and many of the, much of the knowledge about how to exist in the world today. So while we can oftentimes refer to this as new knowledge and new ways of doing things, it's really predicated on ancient knowledge and ancient ways of being in the world. So my advice to you is to not only kind of look at what's out there now, but also now to go back and to search that ancient, that those uh, texts and those elders and those ancient repository of knowledge to be able to fully understand that it's not just the physical world that we're dealing with, but it's also the spiritual world that we're dealing with as well. Something I want to um, share from my own experience as a, I would say as a lost child of indigenous culture. Translation, I was born into civilization. I was born into the modern world. And anthropology and paleontology tell us very clearly every human being alive today is descended from indigenous ancestors. As more than 99% of human history was indigenous. Hunter-gatherer societies, or um, per perhaps they were um, nomadic within a region, but still they were always connected to landscape and place. And when I was learning about different cultures and the names for the indigenous peoples, something that slowly crept up on me was that when an outsider would ask the name of the indigenous people, often the indigenous people would give the name for their land as the name for their people because their identity is so deeply connected to place. I grew up in Missouri in the United States. My ancestors come from Italy and other places in Europe, which basically means I have no idea who my indigenous ancestors are. I'm a lost child. So I'd love to explore how can we help those of us who don't know the land of their ancestors. From, from you know, where your culture still has the connection, you know where your ancestors are from. I spent decades being lost in the world, not knowing where my ancestors were from. And I wonder what advice you might give for those of us who are lost to help us find our way. Well, I think the, the most beautiful thing is that no one's lost. No one's ever lost that all of those things that help to support life are all still waiting for us and still looking at us to be able to fulfill our responsibility as, as the real human beings. So I think that uh, recognizing again, as uh, Joe talked about, you know, we are all indigenous from somewhere. You know, when we follow our roots back to the ancient beginnings, we've all come from somewhere. We've all emerged from a landscape. And that landscape and what it's been able to provide has denoted or genetic differences. So we, while we're as human beings, we may be 99.9% .9 .9 the same. In many cases, it's that 0.01% difference that differentiates us from one another. And that part that we talk about, it is all emblematically depicted in our genetic structure. 
So there was a story, you know, a while back that they had found the remains of a, a woman and they traced that uh, ancient remains of a woman and they traced that right back to a, a valley in Africa and by looking at the bone marrow and the DNA. So if we have all of us, you know, come and emerge from the earth in particular places, that earth and that place is still waiting for us to be able to go back and to touchstone with it again. And that our ancestors, our knowledge, and while today in this world, you know, in this contemporary society, we've forgotten many of those teachings and many of our responsibilities to connect and to care for creation, then, you know, or the natural world, then again, it's our responsibility to go back and to learn them. So no matter where you decide that you're going to live, there are people that live in those places and have lived in those places for millennia that have a wealth of knowledge. So by touchstoning that knowledge, by accessing that knowledge and by learning about that, you learn the principles and values of how to inculcate that into your world and into your practice and into your behavior about how to live and care for the, the places that you decide that you want to call home. Yeah, for me it was really interesting to discover that somehow I tried to get away from the earth. I got it at a time when I was 12 years old and maybe I want to be an astronaut or maybe I'd be a rock star. And I wasn't sure which. And, and I found myself at one point studying the Earth from space, but looking at satellite data of clouds to see how clouds were changing in uh, the way that we were changing the atmosphere with climate change. One of the things that started to happen for me, which is a, a well-documented phenomenon, it's called the overview effect, which is that when spacewalkers and astronauts go up into space and they see the Earth from space, they have this transformational experience. And oftentimes our astronauts or cosmonauts or whichever culture they came from, many of them are atheists, which means many of them don't believe that they're spiritual. And they discover the awakening of their spirituality by seeing the earth from space. It's called the overview effect. And I had a, a gentler version of that that happened to me. And I started to feel the entire planet was my home, which is what you've said. But then something different happened for me three years ago when I arrived in a landscape in Colombia where for reasons that I can't fully explain, and it's beautifully in that realm of mystery, the land started speaking to me and I could feel a connection, even though my ancestors are not from South America. So it didn't matter that it wasn't the landscape of my ancestors. I started to connect it to the landscape of the ancestors of the landscape. The place I live is the landscape of the Guane people who speak in the Chibcha language family. And they've been in that area for at least 7,000 years possibly longer, but there's evidence at least that far back. And one thing for me that really was powerful was because of my scientific understanding of how water moves through land, when I started doing water retention work, which means I was digging holes to store water to be able to grow trees more quickly, I started finding a deep connection with the land and opening up of my own like indigenous spirit. And so I'm really curious how we can find this way forward into a world where so many things are changing now that it's difficult for us to connect to the way the landscapes were. They've been so dramatically changed. Like in this landscape, if you go to some place like the concrete land of, of Toronto, and ask what was this place like for the Algonquin people throughout the last 12,000 years, you'd have a hard time finding it in that urban landscape. And so I'm curious, uh, what do you see as a way that we can find our way back into landscape when so many of us don't have this guidance from our ancestors through the culture itself. Yeah. We're actually in cultures that send so many signals that disrupt us from this connection that we have to find our way often on our own. Mm. Well, well, uh, you're still a rock star. <laughs> you, uh, yeah, you, he's, he's a rock star for sure. <laughs> um, I guess for, uh, you know, the the, the opportunity that we all have and, and recognizing that, you know, in wherever we're going to live and whether it's downtown Toronto, underneath that, all that concrete, you know, is still the earth. And uh, uh, we oftentimes refer to, you know, our, our earth as, or the earth itself as uh, our mother. So we refer to her as Yeti Nisteha o Gio Wenjade. So Yeti Nisteha, the Yeti part is uh, her to all of us. The root word is, uh, is Ohwenja, which talks about this idea um, of the earth itself. When we say yeti ni the the stan part is actually about providing life for us, that it gives us life. We change the, 
the, the pronoun at the front to make it a getnisneha, to refer to our human mother. But we then the behaviors become the same from our human mothers to our earth mother. And so our love, our honor, our respect that we have for our physical mother is the same love, honor, and respect that we have for the earth. So no matter where you decide that you're going to live and wherever you decide you're going to be, the earth is still our mother. The earth is still putting power and strength into that. And we still have the capacity that no matter where we are and no matter how many levels of concrete that they are or how many stories that we live above the earth, the earth is still here with us. The earth is still our mother. So if we begin to understand, you know, in terms of, as you mentioned, you know, this idea that uh, according to our teachings and uh, one of our um, messengers that appeared to one of our leaders way back in the 1800s, his name was Handsome Lake, and uh, they referred to him as Skanya Dario. And uh, Handsome Lake uh, received these visions and they talk about two paths, with, two paths that we can choose. One, they call it a scorched earth path, and the other one, they call it like a, a green path. Mm. And they talk about that that green path is very narrow, and it's steep, and not many people can travel on that. But this scorched one is wide, and that people can travel down that. And many people have traveled down that. But the idea behind it is that what waits for us at the end of it is, you know, pain, hardship, and suffering, or health, you know, happiness, peace, and love on the other side. So we have this choice in life that we all have to make. And uh, that choice then is not just you know, a one-time deal. That choice is in every word that we think, every, every um, expression that we have, every movement that we have. We can either work for the continuation of life or we can work to destroy, to degrade and to deter, and to deter life. So you know, I think that's the opportunity that we have and no matter where we live and what we do, that we have this thing, this precious gift that we call life, and that we're only here for a very short period of time for all of us. They talk about when uh, the human beings are made, when the Creator sends us here with a particular purpose uh, to fulfill. He gives us gifts that we have, you know, uh, been given so that we can help to fulfill our purpose. And I'm so glad that my young brother here has the opportunity to be able to recognize his gifts at an early age and to apply those in the process of working for the continuation of life. That's the choice that he's made. But the point of it is, is that all of us then have that same opportunity and that same responsibility to work for the continuation of life, if we so choose, to recognize and to learn about what our gifts are, and especially young people, to be able to discern what those are and to work hard for it and to apply our life power in the time that we're here uh, to work for the continuation of life. They talk about that, you know, as human beings, we only, we have a stick in our hand that the Creator gives us with the number of notches in it, and that represents the number of days that we're here. Sometimes it's a lot of notches for an old man or an old woman. Other times it's just a few notches and maybe half a notch for the breath, half a breath of a baby that is here, then it's gone. So we are all here in a limited time frame, and our, our responsibility is to put our effort into work for the continuation of life. And everything that is, that is in our world is counting on us to fulfill our ancient responsibility to work for that continuation of life. I wanted to draw from two different cultural traditions to share an insight that came to me that was quite powerful. One comes from the Judaic Christian tradition and the language of the Bible when they say from ashes to ashes and dust to dust. It's something that a lot of us in the Western world hear. I was really struck to learn, first of all, how we are actually literally stardust. Now we know how stellar evolution works and how when stars go through a supernova explosion, they cause this atomic level transformation to create all the heavy elements on the periodic table. So you think of carbon, which is what we are. Carbon comes from explosions of stars. So I was really struck that we are actually animated dust. As living beings, we are stardust and earth dust made animate. And the other thing that really stay, has, has impacted me since going to Colombia, where I live now, is the concept of pagamentos. Unfortunately, pagamentos is a Spanish word for payments, like to make your payments. Like I had to pay the pagamento for my credit card bill, which is a little bit unfortunate when it translates into English, because what they actually mean is the debt of gratitude that we owe to the Great Mother for giving us life. And when we offer pagamentos as a ritual, 
what we're doing is expressing our gratitude to be alive. So if we go to the river that brings life to our community, we offer our pagamentos. And I'm really struck by this combination that if we realize that we really are just dust to dust, that we're the earth animating life and then bringing it back so that our life is no longer animate, but we become part of the life of the earth, so we do continue, that it's a gift and that we owe a debt of gratitude. And this feeling of gratitude to me seems to be one of the most powerful things that is destroyed by our market economies. There are a lot of things that we talk about, like the river that was polluted or the mountain that was excavated from and destroyed or the species that went extinct. But there's something before that, which is we let that happen because we don't feel the blessing of life and we don't feel gratitude. And so I was really struck by this because what I see happening in the world as an earth scientist now is that humans are, and those of you who don't know, there have been five previous mass extinctions, and we're in the first one caused by a single species. Humans are causing a mass extinction event right now. And you just think at a planetary scale what it means for us to have so little gratitude that we might cause 10 million species to go extinct during this century. So little gratitude. And what I find powerful about this way of thinking is that it doesn't put the responsibility on, on me as though I should feel guilty or that I'm wrong or anything that would make my energy less, but that I can actually find the expansiveness of gratitude that even in a time such as this, I'm alive and I can give the gift of life. And then there's one other piece I want to add in that's a biological fact that sort of surprised me one day on Mother's Day. I was typing a little post on Facebook about Mother's Day and I know a little bit about the history of the earth. So I thought, huh, so interesting that sexual reproduction has only been around for about 700 million years. Before that, it was all single-celled organisms, bacteria, who engage in reproduction by cell division, which means all life for the first 80% of life on Earth was mothers and daughters. There were no boys. There were no men of any species. And what that meant was that maleness was an extension of femaleness that grew out of evolution's exploration of creativity. And so I'm really struck by this way that even us boys and us men are mothers because we're part of the life process of helping the mothers to be mothers in any species that has sexual reproduction. And so I was very struck by this because while it's in one sense a biological fact and part of the history of life, it also says something really profound about what it means to give life and that we as humans can know this and then give life, and that this changes so many things. What I'd love to ask is, from the place of this continuity of your culture and its history, and here we are on lands that are very strongly connected with the history of your people, what would you invite for those of us who are visitors to this land now to honor the ancestry of your people? Um, I, I think that in, in a lot of different events that are going on now, you know, there's this whole process of uh, the talk around reconciliation, uh, the talk about the truth and reconciliation. And I think it's incumbent on all of us to be able to, you know, read that report, to familiarize ourselves, because in, inside of that report, which is predicated on an earlier report of the ARC, they call it the RCAP, the Royal Commission on Aboriginal People, uh, that talked to us about the role of education talk to us about the role of us as individuals and citizens in, within Canada in terms of our reconnection and our uh, re-honoring of Indigenous peoples. Part of that process is recognizing that all of us are, are, are on original lands, that there are original peoples that still maintain their um, interest in lands, their recognition, their history. And many of the things that we continue to take sort of for granted today, the foods that we eat, you know, the coffee and the tea that we drink, you know, all come from indigenous roots. Much of the food that we have, you know, even our, our style of dress is predicated on, on indigenous dress. My point of it is, is that in the learning of that and the recognition of that truth and reconciliation, it provides uh, opportunities to, uh, to take up uh, plans of action about what we can do and how we can engage and how we can rectify our ancient relationship. But again, it's really you know, coming down to basic human values and basic human um, principles of how we interact with one another. To be generous with each other, to care for each other, to love one another, 
to recognize the places that we're living and, the, and what has been provided for us, not just through indigenous roots and indigenous contributions, but really what has continued and, and does and is continuing to be provided for us in terms of the, our water, our air, all of the nutrients that we um, manifest out of this, trees, birds, animals, all the biological life that's doing it, that's still continuing to do its job. And then recognizing that we as human beings have a sacred rela relationship and a sacred responsibility to fulfill to all of them. Uh, in one of our uh, prophecies, they talk about that all these things will continue to exist as long as we maintain our relationship with them. So when you talked about the extinctions of species, those extinctions then means that we have, that we have forgotten our relationship with them and that they then think of their job in the world is done and that's when they're pulled back to the land of the Creator. That's how we understand that to be. Mm -hmm. But that's our fault because now we have lost that ancient relationship. So part of our responsibility in terms of your opportunity to learn in a place like this now is to take hold of all of the learnings that you can in terms of not just the Western and the educational learning that you have, go back and to search your roots, go back and search indigenous roots of the places that you live in. You have a wealth of information now that you could, that are just waiting on your, at your fingertips to be able to access uh, and take, you know, take note of that, take, uh, take that in earnest and take responsibility for your own learning because at the end of the day, it's all up to you and understand that those things that are all out there, birds, animals, the sun, the moon, the stars, the earth, the waters are all looking at us to say, is that the real human being that's going to be here to help me? that's going to help rectify and restore the integrity of our uh, systems that help to support all of life. So that's uh, your choice. You can either do it or else you can go back to play PlayStation or eat pizza or watch TV. That's your choice. But r realize that, you know, our choices have consequences. If you want to do that, you know, then get ready for more of the things that we see all around the world, all of the climatic events, the human suffering, warfare, all of the different things that are impacting us as human beings. Or if you choose to do the other, get ready for the benefits of that. That means then health, happiness, peace, love, a rich and abundant biodiversity, clean air, clean land, clean water to be able to drink. And future generations, and it may sound funny now, but future generations, your children and their grandchildren are going to be looking back at you and say, that was my uncle. That was my grandfather. That was my mother or my father that made the difference for us so, wait, wait, so long ago. Dan, it's so nice to get to be here in a conversation with you. Agreed. And really, in this moment in time, it's so special. And what I feel that would be a great way for us to use our time today is to talk about the coming together of worlds and knowledge systems that can enable us to navigate into the uncertain future, informed by a balance and an integration of the best that science and the modern world has to offer, together with the long-standing wisdom practices and wisdom traditions of indigenous peoples, specifically drawing from your own, of course. And one way that I'd love to begin our conversation is to, to ask you, in your experience from your own culture and, and your upbringing, what do you feel makes someone into a good ancestor? And how could that guide us in uncertain times like the time we're living in today? You know, for the benefit of, uh, of the audience, I think it's, uh, it's one thing to recognize, you know, the integrity of, of elders and to recognize the knowledge that they, that they hold. Um, and in terms of that, you know, how we understand it and, and I guess the sort of some of the guiding principles for me have been the opportunity to um, learn and to uh, engage with, you know, our uh, traditional culture to be able to, you know, go back and to be able to uh, ascend those essential traditional teachings that provide, you know, the, the grounding for us as human beings. One of the things that we talk about in terms of elders and, and again today, you know, uh, our reality is that there, you know, we have a lot of olders uh, but we don't have a lot of elders. And so um, in that process then, one of the challenges for us, you know, within the area of education is that how do we create more elders? Because those are the actual ancestors that we would like to be able to uh,
pass on into future generations that they then become the ones that provide the foundational uh, identity, the foundational grounding, the, the elements that are necessary to really call yourself an Indigenous person, that you're connected to place. So in looking at that, you know, going back and looking at those traditional teachings, uh, that's what elders carry with us. They go back and they have that capacity to, uh, to have the blessing to be able to learn from their teachers, from their uh, elders and from their uh, ancestors, that great essential knowledge that we oftentimes refer to as AI. You know, some of the discussions talk about AI as artificial intelligence. We refer to that within Indigenous circles as ancestral intelligence. Mm -hmm. So when we go back and we access that, and uh, those things then have addressed, and again, the important consideration here, I think, for us is really looking at what is the essence of Indigenous knowledge. When you look at, you know, um, some of the literature that talks about Indigenous peoples and Indigenous knowledge, it has something, something similar to uh, indigenous peoples living in place for a very long period of time have been able to ac accumulate vast amount of knowledge about their places that they live through a process of trial and error. Uh, you kind of, when you take that in its entirety, kind of yes, but the trial and error part, no. When we talk about indigenous knowledge and we go back and examine the roots of that, what we're actually talking about is being able to access a body of knowledge that has uh, been provided for us from a place of spirit. So our beliefs and within their oral tradition, they talk to us that our ancestors, that they had such good minds and they had such uh, pure hearts that they could actually go back to and have the capacity to talk to all of creation. So that whenever they were faced with a, uh, an element within the human condition, within the human experience, that they went back and it was, they were provided for by the manifestation of those beings through dreams, through visions, or through the physical beings of them coming forward and engaging with our ancestors. And in that way, then they provided for us all of our ceremonies, our ways of on practice and processes, on, on protocols of engaging with them. And so our culture then has accumulated those over a period of time as we faced particular issues within our human existence, within human experience. And at times, you know, uh, in, in dark times of our history, uh, and all Indigenous peoples can, uh, can uh, attune to this, is that, uh, you know, we have forgotten uh, our original instructions. We've forgotten those things. We've forgotten about those things, and we've paid a price for it. But the beauty of that is that we recall them, we remember those things, and we vow then never to happen, never to let those things go again. And we've then worked tirelessly to maintain that ancient connection of that knowledge and those practices and that premise right up until today. So the beauty of that then is being able to embed that within our lives. And when we talk about elders, they've taken those teachings from before there was time, since time immemorial, beyond memory, and we've put those into practice and they have then embedded that learning and that has become the foundation of how they live their life. So they have taken ancient knowledge and applied that within their lived experience and whether that's 20 years old, because there are some 20 year old elders, 40, 50, 80, 100 year old people, they've embedded that life experience with them and that's what they offer, that's what they carry and that repository of knowledge then in terms of everything that's necessary to address the human condition connected to place, you know, has been able to uh, allow our civilizations not just to subsist as oftentimes, you know, relegated by the West that they, it's a subsistence type of living, they've really enabled our people to flourish and our civilizations to flourish. So out of that has come, you know, a dynamic richness and a connection to place, a richness of knowledge about how to live in place and how to care for a place. And so those principles and values then are the things that are, that in my opinion are missing within a modern context, within a Western context, that we need to be able to look at and to examine and to have, you know, that process of value change. And my uh, good friend, Oren Lyons, oftentimes talk about that and he's, uh, you know, has different resources that he's provided in terms of uh, videos, etc., that talk to us about the necessity of, uh, of uh, value change for survival. 
So the values within modern society then are disconnected, are ecologically inappropriate. And for us as Indigenous peoples, are culturally inappropriate to uh, being able to live in place sustainably. And we're talking about living in place for millennia and having that rich biodiversity. One of, the, uh, one of the slides that you shared with us today, you know, showed that beautiful continents and the richness of those um, uh, watersheds. And so, you know, be beginning to look at that within each one of those watersheds are unique knowledge systems of Indigenous peoples that have lived there for millennia. And so the, the question then becomes, and again, you know, recent research talks to us about this idea that when we look at the globe and we look at the biodiverse, the richness of biodiversity, you can almost surplant the places where indigenous, thriving indigenous cultures still maintain jurisdiction or still maintain connection to place and they become overlay in there. Coincidence? Maybe. But what if there's something that from those indigenous cultures that, we have, what, that would be of benefit to all of us to be able to survive, you know, in this Anthropocene that we are in the middle of right now and the extinctions that you've talked so well about today. I'd love to add a, a scientific lens that completely corroborates and supports what you've said, which is the lens of dual inheritance theory within cultural evolution, which basically in a simple form says that all living organisms have a genetic inheritance. So they pass on their genes to their offspring. But there are some species that pass on social behaviors. And for humans, with our semantic and linguistic capacities, we can actually create cultural inheritance systems, which includes the creation of social niches. And one very important social niche is language. And within language can be repositories of knowledge. So there's a very powerful connection between what's called biogeography, which is that different species will evolve in different landscapes. So you can see the geography of something like in the Andes Mountains, there are these very high valleys going from high up in the mountains down to the coast below. You can go 10 kilometers, one valley to the next, very different ecosystem, because the mountain range itself has separated them for a million years. So there's a geography of biology. But what's interesting is with these cultural inheritance systems, that you can see the same thing with culture. The language that evolves, the cosmovision, and the religious systems and the beliefs that they have are profoundly connected to the kinds of plants and animals and cultural practices of each place. So I would say that is strong corroborative evidence saying that the science of cultural evolution would strongly support what you're saying. And what I find so powerful about this is that the one thing that is necessary for evolution to occur is there needs to be an environment which means there needs to be a place where the organism lives. And this is something that I'd love to pick up now, which is, as you said several times in the conversation a moment ago about ancestral knowledge, it's connected to land. And just the same would be there's a type of butterfly in this valley that's not in that valley because the land is different. And so what I would love to ask now is, as we sit in this moment of precariousness, with all of the threats that are emerging for us to deal with, especially for the younger generation. What do you see as a, a role of the land as a way of organizing how we think, feel, and act in the context of the living systems that are within them? And how does that relate to the very same ancestral intelligence you were just describing? I think that you know the unique opportunity in, um, in some of the the presentation that you talked about earlier, you know, when we talked about kind of nomadic uh, hunters and gatherers. And, uh, you know, to really realize that, you know, within that confine uh, of, you know, cultural um, geography that you talked about, you know, recognizing that, you know, Western processes in terms of colonization are the real nomads. You've taken a Western culture and be able to spread it, you know, all around the world and being able to not only monetize it, but, but standardize it in a process that no matter where you are, it all looks the same. Recognizing the richness of, and, and uh, let's call it the uniqueness of, the, and of diversity that exists within biological regions or bioregions, then you can see the connection of those teachings and those ways of life that are unique to that. The question then really becomes, you know, when people live in places of, uh, for millennia, you know, did the did the environment make the culture, 
or did the culture make the environment? And to have, you know, a perfect symbiotic relationship between culture and landscape, that's really where we, need, where we all need to be. And through that process of evolution within indigenous cultures and the places that they're living, the opportunity to share ideas and to share, you know, thinking. Um, when we take North America, for example, uh, one of my friends a uh, long time ago, he's passed now, his name is Guyo Taylor. Guyo Taylor talked about this idea that there were 13 confederacies throughout North America. And he talked about the linkage then of trade between all of those confederacies and how that they emerged out of their landscape, how they protected, defended, and at the same time worked to, re re to maintain and sustain the, let's call it the fecundity of the places that they were living, so that people were able to enjoy a rich biological diversity, but at the same time to exchange knowledge, ideas, songs, practices, medicines, all different things that we may need it in terms of our trade and commerce, you know, so you could see things from the West Coast over in the East Coast, things from the Arctic down into the, you know, the, into the Panhandle, things from, you know, the, uh, the Central America all the way up into the Arctic. So there was this constant exchange of goods and commerce and trade and at the same time knowledge. And so that practice and process really allowed, you know, those confederacies and peoples to flourish all throughout North America. And so the, I think the beauty of that in recognizing, you know, the essence of where we are right now is that, you know, in terms of the modern world, students can, don't have to travel from one end of the continent to the other. They can just push a button and be able to access knowledge from all over the world and be able to learn from that. I think the common denominator, you know, of being able to assess the value of knowledge that we're being exposed to, and I think that we need to really be, um, what would we say, cognizant of the of what we're exposed to in terms of our knowledge, because we all know that you know you turn on your computer and you can go anywhere in the world and you can see all kinds of things, both things that that are that are good, things that are not so good. But the idea behind it is that if we have a filter on our on the things that we learn, and if those that filter becomes uh, a process of how we understand life and how life continues, and our responsibility to work for that then that becomes the common denominator of how we discern and assess knowledge that's coming forward. If it works for the continuation of life, it, if it helps human beings, if it helps you know, maintain the, uh, those foundations that we all depend on within life, of water, of air, of land, of biological life, then you know, those things are, 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 are important for us to learn. And at the same time, one of the challenges, I think, of our time is really recognizing that um, we have to uh, be, be very vigilant in not appropriating someone else's knowledge. And which means then we have the opportunity when we appropriate it to misappropriate it, to misrepresent it. But when we recognize the authenticity and the authority of that knowledge, and the integrity of that knowledge and the source of that knowledge, I think that's what's really the grounding part of it. Going up again back to that beautiful diagram that you shared with us of all of those river systems and the colors of that, you know, to me, when I saw that, it's just like if you were able to overlay the indigenous nations and the tribes of peoples that live throughout all of those areas, to be able to highlight that in a, in a, in a let's call it a, a cultural inventory, if you will, to be able to look at that, to be able to say, you know, the richness of the biodiversity that exists in there, you know, you can directly attribute it to those indigenous cultures that continue, that even to this day, continue to live there in however, you know, whatever condition that they are in. But the point of it is that historically, and again, you know, the, in North America at least, you know, our uh, historical records are quite evident, you know, that uh, as an example, some of the early explorers' records or some of the uh, Jesuit records talk about that um, that streams of water, in particular within our area here, you know, within the Great Lakes, were so abundant with fish, you know, that a man could walk across the back of a uh, of fish uh, in a stream and not get their shoes wet. 
that they could ride a horse from the Mississippi River all the way to the Atlantic Ocean and never have their hat knocked off, you know, because of the understory. That a squirrel could run, you know, from the Mississippi almost to the Atlantic Ocean without ever leaving a tree. So with the abundance of, uh, of biodiversity and the abundance of life that exists, you know, back before the colonization, those ideas and concepts and realities of Indigenous peoples, they are something without question that we need to be able to recognize and at the same time to, uh, to recognize the authority of that knowledge, the integrity of that knowledge, and more specifically the authenticity of that. So that's one of the challenges I think that we have. It's not, uh, oftentimes, you know, within today's world, we, um, you know, we like going to uh, maybe a cafeteria or a, a smorgasbord and we see foods represented from all, all over the area, like all around the world. And we take our plate and we put a little bit of everything all on that. But we, at the end of it, it all tastes good. But at the, at the end of it, you know, we don't know what food is what and how things are. But when we maintain the integrity of that, we can then enjoy foods from around the world and recognize, you know, what it took to be able to make that food, the origins of that, the teachings of that, the history of that. And we benefit from its wealth and recognition of that diversity and the strength and the integrity of that, rather than just adding and stirring everything together. So I think that becomes part of the challenge that young people face today in terms of how they uh, engage information and knowledge, but at the same time, how that they need to be able to recognize and respect uh, the integrity of knowledge and the origins of that. One thing that was coming up for me as I heard you speaking was first going back to a comment you made a few minutes ago that culture does affect landscape and landscape does affect culture. There's a bi-directionality. And one example of this is in the Amazon basin where at least 11% of the Amazon, could be more, but at least 11 is, is certain, that the biodiversity is higher and more resilient because of human guidance in shaping the forest ecology. So there were basically agroforestry uh, types of processes. They're technically called agroecology but that were creating forest ecosystems that were beneficial to humans mm -hmm. and that humans had harmonious relationships with. So that their culture was actually changing the composition of the forest. And this can now be seen with LIDAR on a drone flying over. The surface texture of the forest changes depends, depending on the diversity of plants. There's greater plant diversity in those places that were managed by humans for human benefit and also the benefit of the rest of the ecology. And another thing that was coming up for me was I was thinking of the milpa, which is a type of food system of the, the Mayan people that is at least 8,000 years old and has been going continuously more or less from Mexico down to Belize and Guatemala. And then it has some extensions, but its main focus was in that area. And looking at the three sisters of that region of corn, squash, and beans, which of course came all the way up here where we are in Canada now. And something personally for me that was significant was I grew up thinking tobacco was bad because my dad smoked cigarettes and it made me feel sick. And it wasn't until I went to the Andes that I learned about the medicinal and spiritual practice with tobacco. And then somewhere in the back of my head, I remembered the peace pipe uses tobacco. And my brain hadn't connected those dots because I thought tobacco was bad. And it was just this, this unlearning I needed to do. In all of these examples, what I'm wanting to draw attention to is sort of two points that I think are powerful for our conversation. One is we actually have really good quality knowledge about how all of these things work now, such as the milpa is pretty well studied in Mayan culture and its relationship to corn spreading and becoming the most common food source for humans on the planet. And the other is that we can change our understanding of some of these things, like my relationship to tobacco, where I had a very naive, simplistic, and largely negative view and then I came to appreciate the relationship of tobacco to ancestral wisdom and guidance during times of conflict, of transforming conflict into peace, and of deep healing processes. But I needed to find indigenous people in a culture very different from my own for me to even have the eyes open to see it. And so maybe what I want to talk about now, or to invite us into now, is there's this powerful way of organizing our thinking around the regeneration of landscapes the restoring of watersheds and coastal estuaries and other features of land that have natural organizing principles. 
And part of this is going to be the science of hydrology and soil science and plant biology and physiology to help us do that. But then the other is traditional ecological knowledge and cultural practices. And I think the element that the sciences fail to give enough attention is the role of the sacred. And so what I'd love to do is bring into the conversation this relationship between something like I could grow tobacco as a commercial crop and sell it, or I can have a relationship to tobacco as a sacred connection to my ancestry and to land, and then I could still grow it commercially and sell it. They're not completely incompatible with each other. It's more that this role of the sacred is often left out in the Western worldview. And I think it's a huge omission. And so what I'd love to ask is, for a little of your guidance, for those of us who go learn permaculture or reforestation or watershed restoration and thinking more like engineers, more like a technical way, what are we missing? Or what should we think about or explore to learn about this sacred connection to the land and to the plants, to the water, to the rocks, as we go about this ecological restoration work? Wow, that's a big, that's a big question. Um, and there's a, lot, there's a lot to unpack in that one, so let me try as best as I can. Um, so within our, our program at Trent, as an example, the Indigenous Environmental Studies and Sciences program, um, you know, we, uh, because I'm, I'm who I am, I bring the cultural teachings to that program, but at the same time, you know, I encourage students to engage with the sciences. So one of the things that we, the foundation that we start at within the program is talking about knowledge and knowledge systems and how people learn, what is knowledge and how do we learn? And we talk about this idea of, of constellations of knowledge so that we build a constellation. So you and I as human beings, uh, we have many of the same stars within our constellation. But uh, with me being a Mohawk, you know, I have a different kind of stars in my constellation that I share with other Mohawks, that we, others, that we share with others within the Six Nations or the Haudenosaunee people. So all peoples have, you know, the creation of their own uh, constellation of knowledge. One of the things that we, you know, are challenged by then is by bringing those ideas and concepts that are unique to Haudenosaunee, bringing those forward and talking about them in terms of principles and values. When we look across the board, indigenous peoples that have lived in place sustainably for millennia and have continued to enjoy not only a rich bi the biological diversity that surrounds them, but more specifically that continue to enjoy a rich, um, let's call it a, a functioning culture mm -hmm. uh, in terms of both their physical engagement and their metaphysical, their spiritual engagement with place that they have, uh, that we as indigenous peoples share that across, you know, across the land. But understanding that we are all indigenous from somewhere, all of us as human beings are all indigenous from somewhere, these then become uniquely human values that when we look across the globe and we look throughout human cultures and human history, we see that many times that those things emerge all around the world. But you know, our reality is today, you know, in terms of the society that we are all participate in now, that we've forgotten a lot of those principles and values that they're no longer in our in our worldview. It's those principles and values that have allowed us to be able to live in place sustainably in terms of both our cultural practices, but at the same time, in terms of our understanding of the sacred, understanding of the metaphysical. So we have these two elements that are conjoined together, the physical and the metaphysical. Oftentimes within the West, we oftentimes talk about, you know, the dichotomy of those things, but those things are integral. They are, they are, are based together. Even our understanding of us as human beings, that are, we are spiritual beings wrapped in a physical form, that we're having a human experience here, that when our time is up and our bodies, you know, go back to our mother, the earth, and our spirits go back to Garanyage or back to where the, the land of the creator, um, that teaching then for us, it tells us then as spiritual beings that spirit is in everything and where we are today within education, within our Western consciousness, uh, you know, we have deluded spirit or we have disengaged spirit from our reality. So for the unfortunate part, you know, uh, many of many people in the world, you know, have followed that suit and have disengaged it from that. 
But our teachings then talk to us about the necessity of understanding what, that's, what that is. So when we look at something like tobacco, well, we have, you know, in a physical form of tobacco. And again, to be clear on, you know, what, you know, the, what you kind of presented to me was the idea that, you know, in terms of our tobacco, um, for us, we still maintain, you know, our original tobacco. And our original tobacco is, uh, is, is somewhat different from the commercial tobacco that we see today. So our original tobacco, you know, is green and it's small leaves. And now uh, that man-made, now hybridized, now genetically modified plant that we see today, you know, is big leaves that turn brown when they're dry. And that's what they make, you know, tobacco and uh, cigarettes, cigars and, you know, and um, pipe tobacco out of. So that's the tobacco that is not the tobacco that we're talking about here. Our tobacco, and if you want to smoke it, you know, you're more than, ha ha uh, more than welcome to be able to try it, but it's strong, strong, strong. So uh, in the uh, original times we, within our creation teaching, we talked to, they talked to us about when the earth was created, um, it was made by a woman that fell from the sky and she was already pregnant, she had a daughter. The story is a long story, it takes about three days to go through it, but my point of it is, is that when she gave birth, she gave birth to a daughter. The daughter, you know, uh, met uh, sky world beings that, had, that were living in the world at the time, and she was, uh, became impregnant. She uh, gave birth to two sons. When her, she gave birth to two sons, one of the sons came out of her side and burst her life, and they put her back into the, um, uh, back into the earth. Uh, and covered her up. But before they covered her up, her mother, who was the sky woman, when she fell from the sky, she grabbed certain plants and she held them in her hand. And as she, now that her daughter's body had, uh, has, has life expired, she took those seeds that she, when she fell from the sky and took them and spread them on the body of her daughter. And then he talk about then they covered over with dirt. And so as they talk about then what came out of her body, from where her head came tobacco, from where her breast came, uh, corn, beans, and squash, from where her fingers came uh, uh, strawberries, and from where her feet were came potatoes. So the idea behind it is that uh, in our tobacco, that's the thing that connects us to all of the things that were th it are in creation or are in the natural world. They, create, they connect us to both the physical world, the seen world, and the unseen world. And this is the power that, ha that it has, that when we burn that tobacco, either in pipes or we put it in the fire, we burn it, the smoke carries up and it carries our thoughts to the, even to the creator or to all of creation, whatever it is that we want to talk to. So if we can think about that, that becomes our megaphone to whoever it is that we want to talk to or give thanks to or to recognize or to honor to or to affirm or to ask for help. So that tobacco then, you know, is our, for us, that's what the nature of that sacred tobacco is and that's why we use it that way. So uh, again, going back to you know, your, your question, in terms of you know, how we see these processes and how we can kind of engage in that and the role of technology and how things are changing all around us now. I think that you know, the foundation as we use within a program is to go, back to, the, to go back to just that, the foundation to learn from that. Those principles and values that come out of that are unique to indigenous peoples that allowed them to live in place for millennia and we can learn from that. And then to recognize that those are human values that are all of the gifts. That when we go back within our respective cultures and we go back far enough, we can see that all people live by, those, uh, by that up until recently, up until like 5,000, th three, four, 5,000 years ago. And so if we understand that those become the principles of how we live, then it creates a different kind of consciousness and a different connection to it. But again, we're not going to get there without recognizing the necessity of spirit and what spirit provides for us. And a lot of times, you know, um, and not to dominate, you know, the, our talk here, but, you know, a lot of times spirit, people think about spirit like, oh, that's like woo, 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 you know, that's like something like with something that we don't want to engage with. We don't know about that. But I can tell you, like, in its, in its very, very, very simplest iteration of what spirit is, if we can understand that, you know, 
for, and again, you know, your background in physics comes to the forefront. You know, if we can understand that everything is made of particles and molecules, everything is conjoined together in particular shapes and, and with the way that we interpret them, and they're all vibrating together, everything is moving, then we would consider them to be alive. And when we look at the natural world and we see that they're all molecules and particles and that they're all alive, then we uh, provide for them you know, that they are sentient beings, that they are all alive. And so that they have a spirit they, they, as they're moving, that we have the opportunity and as human beings to engage in that process that we can either work to acknowledge them and enjoy the, the, the movement and the, the, the living part of that, or we can work to deter or to degrade that by just our intent. And so when we understand that our great ancestors so long ago, you know, engaged with the world around that and they uh, honored them, they strengthened them, they imbued them. And when they listened to the words of the human beings, then they all came forward and they all, you know, worked to their, to the benefit of, of ecology and at the same time helped us the human beings. And we've had that unique sacred relationship right from the very beginning of the first human beings where those teachings came from. But it was all the engagement with nature and, come, and them coming forward to be able to help our ancestors so long ago and gave us you know, our cultural practice. One thing that was, um, became present in my awareness as I was listening and it really helped for me to, to feel deeply connected to what you were saying, which comes from a, a critique of part of Western philosophy that was important in my own development. And I learned this from Fritjof Capra when I was a teenager which was that the clockwork universe as a metaphor, which we received from Galileo and then strengthened by Descartes, this whole idea that basically the universe is this giant dead machine, and then there's some other universe that the soul comes from, from some other astral plane, and then it enters into the living beings of humans, and even animals are just machines that can be dissected and cut. And all. This is you know, 17th and 16th, 16th and 17th century thinking. One of the things that really struck me about how wrong that is, how like factually incorrect it is, not just wrong ethically, but it's actually not, it's not how the world works at all, was in this realization that not only is the earth alive because it has a biosphere, <laughs> there's, there's life on the earth and in the earth, but I started asking myself the kind of question that I'd ask my six-year-old daughter, is this rock, you know, pick up a rock, is this rock alive? Now, what most of my science education would tell me is, no, it's not alive. And you might look inside and find some bacteria. They're alive, but the rock isn't. But I spend a lot of time in places like the Utah desert, or where I grew up in the Ozark Plateau in Missouri, where there's all this sandstone. And then the sandstone has caves that move through it, or it forms canyons. And what is sandstone? It is the layered bodies of calcium carbonate from shelled bodies, from uh, animals from the ocean that have accumulated on the seafloor and then sometimes they get pulled down through subduction and plate tectonics and get pushed up with fossils as part of mountain ranges and sometimes they just settle and erosion exposes them which means even if that rock technically doesn't have any microorganisms at the moment it is the fossil or the frozen life of a past living being and what I started to realize was when I go to the level of plate tectonics 200 million years of cycling of magma to reproduce more crust of the earth, and that it is altered and lubricated and changed by the carbon cycle, which includes all those living beings, that when I try to look for the place, well, where is the earth no longer alive? I actually enjoy that it gets harder and harder to find a part of the earth that isn't alive. So it's just this fun little you know, philosophy of science game that I play. What I came to realize, though, when I started really doing regenerative work on the land, you know, let me dig a hole in the right shape that when the rain comes, it actually helps it infiltrate, and then the seeds that land from the wind are able to come into the porous soil and new life comes. And I see the life emerge from the relationship between water, rock, and air. And if I were to ask, where does the life begin? The answer ecologically is all of it together. The minerals in the rocks are essential for the bodies of the plants or for the ants, like the insects or the animals that come along. And so what I'd love to, um, to move this into now is we're in a really powerful moment in human history where we have now accumulated an incredible amount of knowledge 
about how the earth and life work. And at the same time, we have recovered, gathered, preserved, and the indigenous cultures that were hiding and are beginning to share wisdom traditions more publicly to uh, recognize that there's a vast accumulated human knowledge about human cultural history and how we live and how we've been able to have these sustainable cultures for thousands of years, just at the moment where human extinction is becoming a real possibility, that we could damage the planet's biosphere so much, causing a true mass extinction event that causes humans to go away. And what I find so important about the Earth being alive is that if the Earth is alive, then we can recognize that our human beings as living beings are part of the consciousness of the earth. And then this concept that, that the great spirit is pervasive in the living universe would just be present to those of us from a scientific point of view, from a Western point of view, which just creates an access point for these two knowledge systems to touch. It's not the same, and I recognize that, but I just find a beautiful harmony in seeing both sides. And maybe what I'd love to, um, to direct us toward in this part of the conversation, because I'm mindful that we have limited time to talk today, and I wish we could talk for a lot longer. But one thing I'd love to explore is, how can we help bring the wisdom, and maybe it's almost like the, the, um, the deep history of the accumulation of wisdom traditions, how they slowly do build up over time, and the ability to access massive stores of ancestral knowledge are profoundly connected to this. How can that relate to the preservation of biodiversity? And maybe to focus it just for the beginning of the conversation, my friends who do conservation biology work, they would quickly try to explain that there's more resilience in a food web of greater biodiversity. And so greater biodiversity is really important for the health of a landscape and of a place. And that's very important, but it doesn't go as deep as what we're talking about now. And so maybe I want to ask, what is it that's, there's this thing that maybe science can't and shouldn't provide, it's not its role, but these spiritual perspectives of the different cultures bring it in great abundance. And so the dance I'd love to explore is, how can we connect the biodiversity of the living earth with resilient land, and then this relationship to the sacred and to ancestral knowledge, to just start weaving these threads a little bit more clearly for how we can move into practice in the future to restore watersheds and bring biodiversity back and some of the things that need to happen because so many landscapes are now degraded. Mm -hmm. Well, it's a great question. Um, maybe let's go back a, a couple of points that you made, you know, and we'll add to them. Um, one of the things that, you know, uh, when we, again, in the recognition of spirit and, uh, and talking about that in terms of how we understand it, uh, what I neglected to talk about then was this idea that, you know, as spirit, um, if we can imagine then that everything is alive that's around us, um, that everything, you know, has this life energy and we can see, see that all of that, everything that we see, it all has life energy. And those things are moving in a certain way. And as we talked about earlier, you know, creation is not something that happened a billion years ago or a number of billion years ago, it's something that's, that is, that's happened, that is continuing, that is unfolding as we, uh, as we are sitting here. And so we have a responsibility as human beings to ensure that creation continues to unfold the way that it was intended and that those future generations of all things, not just human beings, mm -hmm. enjoy a rich biological diversity, clean air, clean water, clean land. Um, and so uh, that process then, that becomes our sacred responsibility. In the recognition of spirit, then, if we, th if we understand that that life energy, we have a choice of either uh, working with it or working against it. Mm -hmm. And so if you want to call that spirit, you know, in its easiest, most, you know, simplest way to understand it, that we then work with that life energy to be able to engage with it so that life will continue or not. That's our choice. And we're the only thing within all of creation uh, that has the capacity to be able to have the, that freedom of choice. We can either work for it or we can work against it. We can either work to sustain life or we can work to destroy or to deter or, or to degrade life. So, and then understand that our choices have consequences. So, um, that point that you, you know, that you brought forward around that sort of, that Cartesian dilemma about 
uh, how we see, you know, the world, you know, as man apart from nature or a part of nature, you know, and that has always kind of wrestled with the with the West and that kind of mechanistic view that you brought forward, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, the 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 I want to call it the Western view of the world and how that that has changed over a period of time. My point of that for us is that within indigenous traditions, and I'll be so bold as to say that within all indigenous traditions, those people that still maintain their original way of life, that still maintain the original connections and their responsibilities to place, see that you know their teachings, their ways of life, their culture, their civilizations did not come out of the minds of men uh, and predominantly men within a Western framework. It, it has come from a place of spirit. So because it has come from a place of spirit, it's perfect in its nature and it has endured. And we see the proof in the pudding of the, in, of the ways of life. Um, so recognizing again, you know, this practice and process of colonization that indigenous peoples all around the world have become subjected to in terms of its con being confronted by Western society and Western culture, that, you know, up until recently, you know, and I'm talking, you know, within the last 20, 30 years, our people have been severely penalized for bringing our knowledge forward. Mm -hmm. Even to this day, you know, our language, you know, is under threat. Our cultural practices are, up until recently, you know, have been negated. You know, back in the 50s, you know, and I was, uh, you know, I, I was born in 1954, but up until the mid 50s, you know, our people were sent to jail for practicing our ceremonies. Mm -hmm. So understanding then, now to say, you know, can you share your knowledge with us when in a hair's breadth, you know, prior to this, we were punished for that. You know, there's a, a reconciliation that needs to take place in our engagement with that and a recognition of the truth and the history that's happened. But at the same time, that aside, you know, our main, uh, how would we call it, our, our main consciousness, our main job as indigenous peoples is to ensure that life continues, not just our life, but all life. And so, you know, as we talked about before, you know, our ceremonial practices that we have, you know, are not just for our families or our communities or our nation, um, it's for all of life. And so the recognition of all of those things and the, our showing our appreciation and gratitude, those things then become bolstered, they become strengthened and that's what has sustained the quality and the fecundity of all life that we see around us and has enabled life to continue. So our main direction or our main, um, I guess, responsibility here on earth is to work for the continuation of life. So when we now engage in these conversations, you know, that idea, that concept is, it comes forward. It's not about privilege. It's not about ownership. It's not about you know, this is mine. It's all, it's really about how do we then effectively uh, and respectfully collaborate together to share knowledge that we can all work together to be able to ensure that life continues. As we talked about earlier, you know, in the fulfillment of prophecy, this is all, you know, these conversations and the work that you're doing and, and uh, the work that all of us are doing that are involved in this, uh, in working, uh, environmental work, in terms of that is, and is, is really a fulfillment of prophecy. So understanding that it's spirit that's driving this work mm -hmm. and we're just you know, get engaging with it and doing the very best that we can for the limited time that we have life. You know? So for that you know, 20, 30, 50, 100 years that we're here, however long that you know, each one of us is here, that when we put our strength and power into that, that's the thing that enables us to be able to um, work for life. And when we then make that connection to those future generations, then we become the ancestors. And we become the ancestors that are recognized by those future generations for making the change that's necessary to, so that life could continue. And it's that process then and the fulfillment of, of prophecy, again, going back to the idea that it's not an add and stir, that there's a necessity of mutual benefit. There's the idea of you know authenticity and recognition and respectful relations of peace and friendship, all of those elements that we had talked about that our ancestors have engaged within the treaty making that have come to the forefront, 
that we do this not in terms of just, you know, us as human beings and our connection to the earth, that we're actually doing it in the face of all life and that we become co-creators and the work that you're doing is an example. You become the co-creator of the of the the opportunity to facilitate and to strengthen the continuation of life in each of our regions that we decide that we're going to work well, this in. This is something I would love to, um, this may be what becomes the focus for the closing of our conversation so we only have about 10 minutes left. But I want to bring in bioregionalism because I see bioregionalism initially as a back to the land movement that started mostly in the United States in the 1960s and 70s. And so th there's a history of that word similar to permaculture being things that arose that actually borrowed a lot from indigenous cultures and in many cases didn't give them proper credit, although in few cases they did. So it was, it was mixed in that sense. But what I love about bioregionalism as a, as a perspective, not necessarily as a word or even as a movement, but as a perspective, is that we can start to see how landscapes organize themselves naturally as living systems. And then we can see how human cultures co-evolve in this bi-directional way with the landscapes that they're connected to. And what I see is really powerful for us in this respecting and honoring of the different knowledge systems is that there are ways that they can come together because they honor place. So there is someone who arrives like they're here in the Toronto area where they have the Oak Ridge Moraine and it's this massive sponge in the land for generating waterways for many rivers, that there can be people that are coming to protect and care for that geological feature and its capacity to bring life from many different perspectives and backgrounds, and that they can blend rituals and ceremonies in the spirit of human connection to that, that in some cases are directly related to indigenous practices, and in others may just be we're going to celebrate the full moon and we're going to all gather and have a party and play some music and have a good time. You know, what I'm saying is it could be that it, it can have various levels of connection. And what I find so powerful about the bioregionalism perspective is that the thing that is shared is the land itself. So just like that Oak Ridge Moraine here is, this is a feature of land that regardless of our worldview or our cultural background, we can come to shared understanding of its need for holistic health. And then we can blend together our care and the places that care is sustained in the practices of healing or guardianship or stewardship of that place. And so I feel this really powerful opportunity to take this conversation between the different knowledge systems back to the land itself. So it's no longer something like an academic seminar series at a university, although those things are very important too. Uh, but the place that brings it to a real depth of integration is how do we care for the land together from our different points of view. And so I guess maybe what I want to what I want to ask for your reflections on is here we are in a land that is connected to your ancestry. I'm not from this land. I'm from a land in the Ozarks in the middle of uh, you know, Missouri in the middle of the United States which has its own ancestry. And I'm no longer doing regenerative practice there. I moved away from there decades ago. And then I come to a place like this saying, let's talk about bioregionalism and landscape regeneration. And what I would want to know in, a, in this specific landscape is how could an outsider like me who has this perspective that really cares and really wants to help, how can we begin this dance of sharing our knowledge tradition in service to the land so that both of our knowledge systems, or however many they are, become in service to the land itself as a place of creating that neutrality and integration for a new world to form. Well, um, I guess the, you know, the, the place to start for me, you know, is to look at, and if we use that bioregion as a model for that, you know, and we look at, you know, the, uh, the traditional territories of indigenous nations, they're all located within, uh, uh, I guess really sort of river, or water areas, they're located within those um, uh, watersheds. And at the same time, they are located uniquely within, you know, those particular bioregions. So when we are talking about bioregions, it's the, the, the authenticity of recognizing and affirming and honoring the indigenous knowledge systems and practices that have come and emerged from that area. And again, you know, whether the the landscape, whether the environment had made those cultures, 
had formed those cultures or whether the cultures had worked to form that or whether there's a perfect, my point is that there's a perfect symbi symbi symbiism or symbiotic relationship between those two or else that culture wouldn't, wouldn't exist yeah, over something millennia. Something I always say, I often say is, the first approximation of the bioregion is probably the ancestral culture of the indigenous people for exactly this reason. Exactly. And so I think that that, that becomes the place to start. What are the principles and values and practices of, of the indigenous peoples that are there to honor that and to engage respectfully in the, our collaboration with the, the knowledge holders that, it, that exist within those areas? And to form then and to recognize that, you know, the uniqueness of, of let's call it the, the, the human diversity that exists within those regions as well. Because again, you know, when you look at the greater Toronto area, as an example, then, you know, we recognize that every culture is represented within here. Well, every culture has brought knowledge, maintains knowledge and connections and understandings that may be of benefit to us living in the area. Because again, the complexity of the issues that we're facing right now in terms of the things that we have to deal with and the, the pollution, the overpopulation, the degradation of soils, the eradication of species, I mean, you know all the list of them. Each one of us then, in our understanding of it, has been given gifts and we uh, have been able to ascertain knowledge over our short life period. In the application and the sharing of that knowledge to address the, um, the issues that, w that are confronting all of us, that becomes the unique opportunity to create, uh, I want to say, true collaboration. Can I add an example there? Mm. So one thing I studied in graduate school was satellite remote sensing which is you look at satellites that are orbiting around the Earth to study land surface changes and clouds and other things. And then that data is fed into computer models and visualized with computers. And it's connected to ground sensors and other things like in a river network for the water flow or whatever it may be. And these are all things that were created by the Western world. Mm -hmm. But to bring those into a conversation with indigenous knowledge traditions about the management of the land adds another way of seeing the land that may be very important because of the pace and severity of change. Yes. And so I see this beautiful blending of this advanced science and technology, in this case represented by the Earth observing system, together with this traditional knowledge. And I feel that if that satellite data, which I studied in graduate school at one point in time, that did not tell me how to heal the land, but it did help me see where the land was sick. And then I could bring that kind of holistic systemic knowledge together with, oh, there's this woman who is an apothecary. She's an herbalist and she knows the local bushes and shrubs. And she knows how to make medicine, which means she's probably holding indigenous knowledge. And that the practices of protecting and honoring the knowledge of those plants is a very important part of healing the landscapes that we observe from space with satellites. And so I feel that this, this is such a unique opportunity right now in this, in this moment in time to elevate the best and most important knowledge we have from our different knowledge systems in service to the land itself. And the largest expression of that is the planet as a whole. Uh, I couldn't agree with you more. <laughs> I mean, the conversations that are happening right now, you know, between NASA and uh, Native American tribes, they're, you know, they're, they're engaging in the conversations just like that. Like, how do we, ha how do we then examine you know, the condition of the land and how do we begin a process of healing the land? So I think that the utilization of technology in that aspect is something that is worthwhile and, and is, 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 a, is, is necessary, as well as the engagement with indigenous knowledge, as opposed to NASA using its, you know, its knowledge to be able to travel to the moon or to Mars. It's like, uh, well, I like to go back to, you know, what my uh, good friend John Mohawk oftentimes talks about. He was, uh, he's a Seneca and he was a professor at the University of Buffalo. He's passed now, but wow, what a great mind. And if you ever have a chance to look up anything around John Mohawk, um, you know, please do. But John talked about this idea that, you know, we are uh, fed this idea. Uh, we're almost coerced by this idea that, um, that technology will resolve all of the issues that we're facing. We just got to wait, uh, continue to do whatever you do, and we're just going to wait for a new technology that will resolve everything and make it beautiful again. Well, he says that, you know, the, there's this common understanding amongst, you know, 
today's generation that, you know, someday we're going to jump on the Starship Enterprise and it's going to take us all the way up to, you know, Mars or another planet and we're going to be able to live there and we'll start the whole recolonization process over there. He says, well, I've got news for you. He says, 8 billion people are not going to travel on the Starship Enterprise. And he says, and our responsibility back here then is to care for this instead of going to, you know, to uh, desecrate, you know, another planet. My point of it is, is that the, the appropriate use of technology, the appropriate engagement with understanding the necessity of, of promoting biodiversity, because it's not about biodiversity for, diver bio for diversity's sake. It's about understanding the uniqueness of the place that supports uh, the, the, I want to call it the original biodiversity of that area, and to see how things can be then shored up when they become, uh, uh, let's call it, when they become uh, desecrated, when they become uh, destroyed or, or degraded, how can we then use technology to be able to help support its, its fecundity, its return again, its re revitalization. So by utilizing, you know, indigenous knowledge and by utilizing those practices within Western science, it's not about simply replicating what exists around to be able to r repair an area. It's like saying, okay, historically, what was there before? Mm -hmm. And our, what we see right now, is that working the way it should be? No, actually, when you talk to people, that is, is degraded from what it was, you know, uh, centuries past and if you really want to here's the species that you need to be able to do it and there's a reason why at least within North America that the richest uh, biodiversity exists within indigenous territories mm -hmm. within indigenous reservations or in under indigenous jurisdiction those that richness of, of uh, biodiversity that's there can be helped used to be able to repatriate and to restore and to revitalize those degraded areas over there. So, you know, it's the perfect marriage that of, of your application of, you know, Western, appropriate Western technology and, and, and knowledge in with indigenous practices and processes and jurisdiction to be able to manage that. But at the end of the day, you know, we have to say who benefits from it. If it's human beings, then we're in the wrong position for it. If it's all of life, then we fulfilled our, our ancient responsibility. Yeah, one of the things that uh, has really struck me as important from a, almost like a simple practical point of view in doing regenerative design, trying to regenerate living systems using design approaches, is that we have to reconstruct the cultural history and reconstruct the ecological history of place which means connecting with the ancestral knowledge and traditional knowledge systems. And also, for example, in parts of uh, Texas or Colorado, where there are river systems that used, that were deeply integrated with beavers. And then when the beavers were, were removed for, by ranchers for agriculture, the landscapes dried out and the rivers died. Now there's a landscape you can't reintroduce a beaver to because it won't support the life of the beaver. But if you know that there were beavers there, you can use design to imitate the beaver's behavior until the water starts to flow enough until the beavers can be re reintroduced. So this combination of cultural and ecological history is used in creating that. And I feel like this might be the perfect place for us to come to a close in saying that everything we're talking about has a focus on how humans relate how humans relate to ourselves, to our ancestors, to our landscapes, to our places, to each other, to different worldviews and to different knowledge systems. And what I hope is that when others watch this conversation between the two of us, that they'll see that we are both embodying an attempt to navigate this way of relating. And that if more of us practice, you know, practice, we don't know how to do it very well yet. It's like, I'm taking salsa dancing classes, but I got to practice. You know, we're learning how to do it. So we're going to stumble and we can be very forgiving of ourselves. But I feel like this last hour that we've spent together is a role modeling of the process that we've been talking about. And so I just want to, to tell you how much it means to me as a person who lived in colonizer culture and did not like it <laughs> and have struggled for a long time to find my indigenous connections to just say how human it is to sit in this space with you. And that I want to continue practice relating to my fellow humans in this way with you for a long time to come. Oh, I appreciate it. I just want to say thank you so much for this conversation. Well, thank you. And, and may I add to that, you know, the only caveat I would add to the, you know, to the perspective that you just shared was that, 
you know, uh, oftentimes our our culture and our presence, you know, as indigenous peoples is relegated to the his to the history. Yeah. And it's really recognizing, you know, that we are that while we are informed by that and that becomes our foundation, that we are relevant and that we are, you know, in 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 situ right now. We are in place right now and has a vast amount of knowledge and the knowledge that, you know, I can be bold enough to say that the knowledge that we have have access to we're actually only scraping the top of the we're only scraping the top of the surface of it and that vast body of knowledge that exists we're only scraping the surface and it's only been within this generation that has had the opportunity to articulate what indigenous knowledge is all about what does that word mean why do we have that ceremony why do we have those dances what is this uh, particular practice that we have what's the origin of it and to be able to ask our elders about that kind of knowledge and that knowledge is slowly coming forward now. So what we're seeing right now is really, and to, you know, to be honest with you, it's baby food into where, what we're able to access as we delve deeper into that. Joe, I really want to thank you, you know, for the time that you spent with me. And, uh, you know, I can actually call you a brother because now you're working for our mother, the earth and the continuation of all life. Thank you so much. It's really an honor to be on this path with you. My pleasure. Thank you.